Hello and welcome to Roundtable. The Balkans are currently facing their worst political crisis since the 1992-95 war, which left more than 100,000 people dead. As the country seems to be breaking apart, will armed conflict return? Well, there are growing concerns of renewed bloodshed in Bosnia-Herzegovina after Bosnian Serbs celebrated Republic Srpska Day despite being banned by Bosnia's top constitutional court from doing so. Well, the United States has already imposed sanctions on Bosnian Serb leader Dodik. The EU is yet to take action. Good to have your company. I'm David Foster. The man threatening secession is Milorad Dodik, the Bosnian Serb member of the tripartite presidency. He's pushing to withdraw the Republika Srpska entity from the country's army, key political institutions, tax system and judiciary, and create separate Serb institutions. We formed it because we knew that there is no freedom for Serb people if they do not have their own state. The Republika Srpska is our state. No matter what anyone says, and no matter how many times it is challenged, the Republika Srpska wants to live in freedom and to offer this freedom to others. Dodik's call to boycott the state's central institutions is a violation of the 1995 Dayton Peace Accords, which played a key role in ending the Bosnian War. The agreement divided the Balkan country into two autonomous regions, the Serb Republic, that is Republika Srpska, and the Federation, shared by Bosniak Muslims and Croats. According to the agreement, Bosnia Herzegovina is governed by a multiple ethnic-based power system, including a tripartite presidency, one Bosniak, one Serb, and one Croat. Despite the agreement that brought peace to the region, Dodik continues his threats of secession and is further emboldened by his supporters. Delighted to be able to say that joining us for this show out of London, we have James Kerr Lindsay, visiting professor at the London School of Economics. His research focuses on conflict, peace, and security in Southeast Europe. In Sarajevo, we say hello to Nijala Amadashi Sejevic, a journalist and a survivor of the war, and also from the same city, Igor Stojanovic, a member of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina Parliament. Um, I'll come to you, Igor, in just a moment to ask you about the functioning of the state, if I may. But, James, I was interested by something you said in a podcast. You said, you said there's plenty of talk of conflict, and I wonder if there is more than that. Well, I, I think that the, the danger with all of this, of course, is that um, we talk ourselves into conflict. I, I think, you know, as somebody who's, who's watched the Balkans for, for many, many years and has worked on conflict in the region, uh, I, I think there's always the danger that um, we overplay uh, some of the political developments. So, for example, at the moment, what we are talking and, and, and hearing about is talk of secession. And... Uh, that's very unlikely for all sorts of reasons I can go into. But uh, the reality is that then people start to hear it, start to believe it. They start to respond to it. Uh, and that then builds up the pressure. The other side then starts to respond to it. And so we get caught in this sort of vicious circle, which I think is so very, very dangerous. And one of the things, you know, we have to really be thinking about is how you break that. And I think that this is the real danger and the difficulty that we're facing at the moment, that the underlying reasons for conflict really aren't there uh, in, in many ways, but people believe that they're there and they respond accordingly. So you then a situation that does, in fact, become very dangerous. You also say in the same programme that I saw, uh, it, the area now looks as though it will be heading back towards violence. What indications are there of that? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the danger and the difficulty that we're seeing is that uh, as people start to talk themselves into a bit of a frenzy about things and they start to respond accordingly and they think that, you know, well, uh, certainly for the Bosniaks, they think, look, this is what we're facing at the moment is a fundamental threat to the unity of the state and we have to defend that. Uh, meanwhile, many Bosnian Serbs will be looking at the situation and saying to themselves, uh, you know, what's going on here? Uh, are they trying to centralise authority? And 
is this something that we need to respond to? So again, it is about this 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 cycle of of perpetuating violence and talk of violence, which is leading towards it, which I think is so very dangerous. Nijara, you you went through the war. I'm wondering if you're seeing similarities in the pressure cooker environment, as described by James, between then and now. I have to say, even uh, hearing you repeating a couple of times that I'm a war survivor and just opening this topic again and again and reading what I'm reading in international media for so many uh, times and for so long time, it's scary. It's much uh, scarier than being here in Sarajevo and talking with my uh, friends, neighbors, people I meet on the street. You have to know that you are talking with the people, and in my case, personally, I... Uh, still have very strong post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, like many people in Bosnia. And I'm not afraid only of the war, war, war. I'm afraid of fireworks. I'm, if you clap with your hands a little bit louder, I'm afraid. We are afraid of everything. And now talking about this and insisting on this violence doesn't matter if I'm Bosniak, Serb, Croat, and if I'm nothing, because I, I do not belong to any of these groups, it doesn't feel well because you are waking our trauma that is deep, deep, and that we didn't have a time to, to, to deal with over yeah. these 30 years. Igor, let me come to you. Um, I picked up an article just before we came on air about half an hour earlier, which says, what does Republika Srpska want? This is from the International Crisis Group. And it talks about uh, Dodik. And it says the leader of Republika Srpska continues to threaten stability uh, pushing conflicts with central government to the brink, sabotaging the state, risking violence. And do you know what? I Then I thought, I'd better see how recently that was written, whether it was last week or the week before. That was 2011. Nothing's changed. Exactly. Nothing's changed. Uh, as you can see, we are all in fear uh, because of the Dodik's behavior. After the end of January and celebration of unconstitutional uh, Day of Republika Srpska, everything was uh, actually becoming more and more uh, frightened for all the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And, and, and we and can see we can see that the the, um, the militia troops. I don't know. You'll tell me who they are marching through the streets. The ones with the red berets celebrating Republika Srpska Day. Was that intimidatory? Of course, and uh, it produced some incidents around the borders near Serbia, you know, in the eastern Bosnia, where the Serbian nationalists actually also had some, had some events uh, which frightened uh, Bosniaks, Croats, and, and, and other people. So, uh, throwing the same question to you that I gave to Nijara, do you feel that there is everyday tension being ramped up, or is it just, as perhaps has been suggested, people outside? making more of it than it actually is? Uh, well, I will answer as a politician. When, when you have a, a member of the presidency who, who are actually uh, uh, make these uh, unconstitu unconstitutional event on 9th of January, and that is basically destroying the state, and that's why we are all frightened, because nobody is doing that to their own state. If if you don't have any kind of uh, intentions to destroy everything around yourself. So, of course, we are frightened, but uh, I think the, the tensions uh, are less than in 1992, but we have a lot of tensions. That's, that's true. OK, J James, let me ask you this. Does, does the real threat come from Republika Srpska alone, or does Greater Serbia have to back this and see it as provocation if people turn against those in Republika Srpska. Um, if Greater Serbia stays out, is this going to just fizzle out? Look, this is an extremely complex relationship that we're talking about between the Bosnian Serbs and Serbia. And I think there is a tendency to automatically assume that what the Bosnian Serbs want is actually what Serbia wants and vice versa. And I think there is actually quite a lot of tension that exists between Dodik and uh, Aleksandr Vucic, the, Prime Minister, uh, the president of Serbia. Um, now, I mean, opinion is very different on this. I mean, you will have people who will argue that they're one and the same, that, you know, that Serbia is really behind all of this. I actually take a rather different view. I don't think that Serbia is behind this. I think that it views what is going on in Bosnia 
uh, with a lot of concern. Serbia is on a very, very different path. It's, you know, it's, it's working towards EU membership. It's got the issue of Kosovo, which in many ways is more central to many Serbs uh, than the issue of, of, of Republika Srpska and Bosnia. Serbia has stated time and time again that it respects the territorial integrity of, of, of the Republic of Bosnia or of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And it has to if it's making the argument that it wants the world to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Serbia itself. Um, so I think in many ways they find Dodik very difficult to deal with. But, and this is an important but, there is a large percentage of the Serbian population that does feel uh, rather nationalistic. I, you know, one couldn't really say exactly how much it is. Uh, not as great as often people on the outside imagine, but there is an audience that has got to be catered for. So Vucic can't just simply cut Dodik free and sort of say, all right, look, we're going to have nothing to do with you. You're causing problems and everything. So it's a very difficult balancing act that I think Serbia faces on this. Um, but it is certainly part of how we have to deal with the overall situation in Bosnia. But I think, as I say, we, we need to be a bit careful about automatically assuming that, as some people do, that Serbia is really behind yeah. all of this. Uh, OK. Uh, Nijara, uh, we've had the European Union brought into this, and it's something that we need to address. And I'll start with the fact that a number of members of the European Parliament um, are being openly critical of the Enlargement Commissioner, that is the man whose job it is to look at other countries, perhaps during, joining the European Union, that is Oliver Verheyli. And apparently he's being accused of encouraging secession by supporting what Dodik is doing and saying, and the MEPs are furious about this. Now, it's this, this lack of clarity from within the European Union that may make it easier for those people that want to cause trouble to do so. I can answer simply yes, but I also have to, I really, you're insisting on talking about Dodik. Dodik is not the only problem in this country. This is a highly corrupt country. We have politicians who are in charge for more than 30 years, and they're doing a very bad job. They're not nationalists. They're criminals. They are corrupt elites who are making our lives very difficult. That's what citizens of this country are worried about. People in this country are hungry, being Serbs, Croats, Bosniaks, or nothing of all these three. And I have to, again, to stress, there are some people who do not belong in one of these three groups that everybody wants to put and, us and, in. And do you blame and the European central Union, government? Sorry, do you blame the central government or do you blame a powerless parliament? Because we have Igor with us. He could maybe answer that question as well. I blame everybody and I blame also international community, including the uh, European Union, because Bosnia, what is the fact, is semi-protectorate since 1995. And European Union does not let us develop and start everything and live by ourselves. And that's a huge problem. Oh. And when they find the partners in Bosnia and somebody to talk to, they don't listen to citizens. They listen to Dodik, to Izetbegovic, to Čović, to them, to the very same people who are problem for citizens of this country. Nobody listened to us. And there is something citizens are trying to say. There are court decisions that citizens should be put in the first place. Not even international media, including this show, I have to say, is listening to this. There are people in this country, human beings. We are not animals who are, can be put in one of the three groups. And we want normal life like everybody else and nobody is listening to us. It's not everything about Dodik and it's not everything about what you are. It is, of course, a problem. No, no, I, but I, if somebody tries to listen to citizens, you will hear a different voice. I understand what you're saying. You may also agree to some extent with this um, soundbite from Dodik who's going on about the fact um, that the international community really isn't paying proper attention. We must also say that this is not the Republic of Srpska that is destroying Bosnia, but rather those who are destroying the constitution. And this is what was largely done by the Western countries that are involved here on the Muslim side. I have to say here today openly that all these years, the United States, Great Britain and significant parts of the European Union have been working against Republic of Srpska on the Muslim side. Igor, let me come to you. You've heard what Nijara had to say there extremely upset, uh, understandably emotional, and she's blaming those people who really haven't put the interests of the people of Bosnia first. Well, uh, first of all, we have problems for 
almost 30 years and uh, it's obvious that the locals cannot make agreement and we need help of international community. Right now it's the problem that we have some uh, disagreements between Washington, Brussels and the office of the high representative. It needs to be bridged and to help Bosnia immediately to solve these problems. When, uh, when Nijara talk, talked about uh, corruption, uh, everybody has to know that corruption is uh, something that is coming with nationalism and with the destruction of the state institutions. And that's why the sanctions from the US uh, came to the Dodik uh, basically because of the corruptions, mostly of, of because of that and destroying of the institution, be, be, because it's uh, very well connected these two processes. And that's why uh, engagement of uh, uh, European diplomacy and international uh, community is very important right now in Bosnia and Herzegovina to support uh, state institutions. James, what has led us to this point? Has it been a disregard for the people of the country, its institutions for for 30 years? What particularly has led us to this, this um, new sentiment, increased, increasingly violent and potentially dangerous sentiment? I, you know, it, it, it isn't one thing that we can identify which has, has led the country into this. It is a whole combination of things. And I, I think, you know, the point that Nichara was raising, very, very important about, you know, the, the, you've got political leaders who caught on to the fact that nationalism, as we say in, in you know, the, the old saying, national, you know, last uh, refuge of the scoundrel, uh, is, is, is very much what we've seen in Bosnia, that you have people here who are corrupt, who've been openly accused of corruption. I mean, Gabriel Escobar, who a uh, senior U.S. State Department official dealing with the Western Balkans, openly accused Dodik of, of playing the situation to protect his own particular position and his wealth that he's made uh, in, in his particular position. And we're seeing that across the spectrum in, in, in all parts of Bosnia. It's a huge problem. But I think there are also um, much deeper problems um, that the various... Uh, peoples in Bosnia have never really come to terms uh, with the settlement that was put in place uh, in the mid-1990s under the Dayton Agreement. I think there's a, a fundamental refusal to accept. So, uh, you know, I often point out the fact that, you know, many uh, Bosnian Serbs resent the fact that, uh, you know, they weren't given the right to self-determination, that they wanted to join with Serbia or to have their own independent state. Uh, that was... Uh, cast out the window by the Dayton Agreement. But I think there's many Bosniaks who look at the situation and say they don't accept Republic of Serbska as a legitimate entity, well, that okay, they see let, this let, as the product ask, of genocide. Let's ask two citizens of that area what they think of your suggestion mm. that um, nobody's ever really been able to swallow the fact that a peace was imposed upon them. Nijarat. Again, I have to say I'm not Bosniak, I'm not Serb, I'm not Croat. It's very hard. Uh, it, it, I have a feeling you want me to, to speak from one of these three positions. No, no, I knew um, exactly uh, that you didn't in, want to speak from that position at all. I'm just asking yeah. you what you, as a citizen of the Balkans, um, thinks about the suggestion that the people there, whoever they may be, don't like the fact that a peace was thrust upon them and they did not have the chance for self-determination. I don't, I'm a journalist for uh, more than 25 years and uh, I work all over the country. I uh, used to write about war crimes for 15 years and to follow the whole process of dealing with the past. I didn't meet many people who told me this. So, and being in Prijed or being, uh, meeting people who were fighters in um, all the sites during the war, I still don't seem everybody appreciate peace. Who might those people be who would want to disturb and put an end to that desire for peace into the, the distance? Uh, politicians who may end up in prison uh, if uh, they uh, don't find a way uh, very soon to. And the war will help them, actually. That's what they are trying to do. This is the way out from, from the prison that, uh, that is more or less close to them. Hopefully, that's what we are hoping for, that they will, they will, that their their, their years of this suffering that we are living through with them will end one day, and they are hoping that it, there is no end for them, that they will forever be where they are. Okay, before I come to you, Igor, let's hear from the United Nations. This is Liz Throssell, who's talking on behalf of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. We are deeply concerned by recent incidents in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in Serbia that saw individuals glorify atrocity crimes and convicted war criminals, target certain communities with hate speech 
and in some cases directly incite violence. The fear and the risk is that such acts, fueled by the continued inflammatory nationalistic rhetoric and hate speech of some politicians, will continue increasing in 2022, as this is a year when elections are due to take place in Serbia in April and then in October in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Is that what we're building towards, Igor, a crescendo of political uncertainty? Well, uh, I think that we are near to, to chaos. That, that's correct for me, but uh, it, it's more than a treat to the peace. It's the fight for the human rights. I will talk as a politician, as a Serb from Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, well, right now, from the Constitution, I cannot be a candidate for the presidency, for example. 30 years ago, uh, I, could, I could be that. And nobody is talking, you know, about this, because election law and the human rights for the Croats are the main problem for the European Union. As well as the main problem for Milorad Dodik right now is uh, imposed uh, uh, law by... Uh, by higher representative about uh, genocide uh, denial. And, you know, that's not the basic problems in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you know. Uh, we just need the constitution, which is going to give everyone all around the territory the same rights. Right who, now... We who's have going to come up with that constitution and who's going to find it acceptable? Uh, uh, well, uh, if I may just finish my sentence there. So, we have four levels of government in Republika Srpska and five levels of government in Federacija, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Brčko district. It's not normal. And you choosing your member of the presidency from half of the country and two others from other half of the country. So it's not normal. Nobody in any European country would not give that kind of constitution to, to their own people. Okay. You know, and that's, that's basically producing tensions uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and nationalism. Uh, James, I want to come to you, but I think I see Nijara teaching to say something, and we've only got a few yeah. minutes left. Yeah. Uh, just to remind, there is a solution, and that's a decision uh, made by the Strasbourg uh, court in 2009, uh, asking, demanding that the constitution is changed and that all the citizens, so not constituent people, but citizens in Bosnia and Herzegovina have the same right. So that, that solution is there. It just has to be implemented, but everybody is ignoring the Strasbourg court decision. Okay. James, we've had the US sanctions. We've had the European Union saying, well, maybe we, we will. Is that indecision once again helping to stoke the tensions? Uh, yes and no. I mean, look, I, I'm, I think that we have seen in recent years uh, a failure of the United, Na uh, <coughs> of the United States <coughs> and the European Union uh, to work closely together uh, on, on the Balkans more generally. I think that that has been a huge problem. Uh, but I think there's also a, a lack of inventiveness uh, that we see. Uh, but a lot of these problems have also, the solutions have got to be found from within. Uh, it, it's not about the European Union sort of coming along and presenting a model for breaking the constitutional deadlock uh, in Bosnia. Now, Nijar mentions very important, the European Court of Human Rights case is Sejic Finci, which um, I, I think a lot of people, she's very right, would reject in, in, in their own countries. Uh, if, if that was the sort of setup of, of the system, uh, you know, the, the, that was put in place. But the reality is uh, that we also have politicians who say, well, look, if you're expecting us to introduce constitutional reforms in one way, what are we going to get out of it in another way? And so there is this very much an entrenched uh, national view uh, that the politicians are taking, because, again, they've become very effective at playing this rather than simply saying, look, all right, we can come from different communities uh, within the Bosnian state, but ultimately our goal will be the success of that state and moving towards European Union, and we can work in a joint uh, approach towards that, and we're just not seeing that happening. So, um, a a again, the outsiders can come with proposals, and they have come with proposals, yeah. many, many proposals over the years. Should we? But it's actually the change has got to come from within. Should be? Should we be waiting to see what happens in terms of the level of rhetoric and, and the consequences um, of that rhetoric in the Serbian elections of April and the ones in, in Bosnia later on in late autumn. Should we be waiting for that? Will that be indicative of perhaps what might come? 
Well, again, I mean, I, I, I am always a bit cautious about saying that, you know, Serbia is going to be, uh, you know, a, a, the key actor in this and what we're hearing from Serbia. But, you know, uh, it, it can have an effect and we will be watching, you know, with a lot of concern if Bosnia does sort of come onto the political agenda in Serbia. I don't think that it will for, for all sorts of reasons. But of course, uh, elections later in the year in Bosnia, you know, this is this is prime time. Uh, this is when the politicians are playing to their audience at their very worst. So I, I think, you know, obviously there will be concern uh, uh, about that as, as, as things move forward. OK, watch the next few months very closely. We will here, and I'm sure you will wherever you happen to be. Uh, thank you, James Kerlinzi. Thank you, Nijarat. Thank you, Igor. And wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable, thank you too. We hope to have your company next time. Until then, from me, David Foster, and from the Roundtable team, Goodbye.